this is Mr. Coates, and this lecture is on uh, human population and its impact. So we're going to talk about uh, how the human population grows. And the, the big question is, are there too many of us? Uh, back in 2012, the world population surpassed 7 billion people. And uh, the world seems big enough for all those people, uh, but uh, it's hard to tell with the resource use that's uneven. And in 2050, they estimate that the world population is going to be around 9 billion. And so we have to see, is the world going to be able to support that many people? So if we look at the history of the human population, basically uh, the first society were hunter-gatherer societies. And these uh, groups of people were mostly intent on finding enough food, enough fuel uh, to survive. And so as uh, time went on, uh, population started growing and agriculture started uh, coming about. And agriculture really helped uh, spur human population because the fact that they wouldn't have to move around to follow game, they could grow vegetables, and domesticate uh, livestock and so forth, basically gave people the ability to stay put and then possibly provide more than they really needed. So more people uh, started being born. As we went into the Industrial Revolution, healthcare really became uh, a, a lot better. Uh, antibiotics came about. Uh, people uh, were living longer. Uh, our food technology got better. Uh, people were eating more nutritious meals. Water quality got better. Uh, and so people were starting to live a lot longer. And then finally we're in the technology age now where technology is really the driving force behind the ability for the human population to grow. If it hadn't been technology, then we wouldn't have had the green revolution uh, where we would uh, had uh, synthetic fertilizers and tractors and things like that to produce the amount of food that the amount of people on this planet need. So all these things really pay, played a role in how our population grew over time. If we put all this information into a graph, we see something that's really startling. We see that over the last 200 years, the human population has grown exponentially. That's this J-shaped part of the curve right here. As in the early days, basically things like uh, disease, famine, wars kept the population at a very low level. But as time went on and our technology got better, our food got better, and sanitation got better, the population just exploded over the last 200 years. And so we're now up to 7 billion people right now. And uh, so we have to think about, are we going to have the resources for those seven billion people, and are we gonna have resources for the people that are expected to come after those seven billion people? The people who study uh, human population are called demographers. So this whole study of the human population is human de demographics. A lot of this might be similar to uh, if you studied uh, human uh, geography in the past. But um, we'll, we'll look at how populations change, and there are, there are four things that make the size of a population change. First of all, birth rates. Uh, how fast babies are being born in the population. Then we have immigration. Uh, how uh, often do people move into a society? And then on the negative side, we have the death rates, so how fast people die. And then uh, immigration with an E is how fast people move out of the area. So what you wanna do is you want to have zero population growth is what you would really like as a country. And to do this, you need to balance the birth rates and immigration with the death rates and the immigration. And usually this figure, your birth rate, you write around, you want right around 2.1 children per couple in order to replace the, the couple when they die. And this is called the replacement birth rate. Now, demographers like to make things simple on themselves. Rather than talking the, the entire population, they like to talk in terms of thousands. So they they have a term called the crude birth rate, which is the number of births per thousand people. And the crude death rate is the number of deaths per thousand people. Now another term they also use is the total fertility rate, also known as TFR. And this is the number of children born to a woman during her lifetime. Now we just mentioned that the replacement fertility rate is about 2.1 children per woman during her natural, her childbearing years. If you get over 2.1, then you start getting that exponential growth. So for the world, the TFR has been around 2.6 over the last couple of years. And so we are still growing at an exponential rate. If you look at the TFR in the United States, our total fertility rate has gone up and down depending on what's happening in our country. 
So at the beginning of our country, we're basically uh, kind of a farming society, and we wanted lots of children in our family in order to help us uh, make those crops. So we had quite a few children. However, we didn't have good medicine at the time, so our death rate was pretty high too. So we had a pretty high fertility rate to start out with. As time went on, then we had some wars and things like that, and so the fertility rate went, went down because of that. But after World War II, when all the soldiers came back, it was a very happy time, and the economy was back on track and so forth, and so everybody started having babies, and our total fertility rate went way up. And this was called the baby boom back in the 1950s and 60s. Now we're in a stage where um, we're kind of at replacement level here in the United States. Our, our TFR has gone way down after the baby boom thanks to birth control and family planning and also uh, empowerment of women. That was a huge one and we'll go into that in a minute. But uh, in the United States our TFR now is about replacement level and so even though it's a little bit above we're still kind of growing. We're not growing as fast as we could be. Alright so let's look at some things that affect our fertility rates. Uh, so our affluence, our level of education is if you're more educated, chances are that you are working, uh, you have uh, in, uh, income means and so forth, and therefore the higher your education level, the higher your income, the lower your TFR. Also importance of children in labor force. A lot of the developing countries still use children in labor force for like sweatshops or agriculture. And so they want lots of children in their culture. That way they have lots of workers. Uh, as you decrease the importance of child labor, then your TFR goes down. Also, the urbanization of our society, the fact that we are moving to cities um, in great droves, actually, this is actually lowering our t TFR because people no longer need babies and children to help them work on the farm or work on the estate or whatever. And so when you move into the city, less children are being born. And also, these people, usually in urban areas, have better family planning. Another factor that is controlled TFR is the cost of raising children, especially here in the United States and some of the other developing countries. Uh, it is no longer very cheap to raise children, especially if you want to send them to college. And uh, so the cost is actually... Uh, prohibited for a lot of families to have a lot of children. One of the most important things is the education of, and empowerment of women. Uh, in the 1960s we had uh, the feminine revolution basically in the United States and women became more empowered, they learned more about their bodies, birth control became uh, widely used in the United States and women started making own decisions about their bodies and about uh, their lives. And when that happened, the total fertility rate in the United States dropped considerably. Also, this happens in other countries as well. As soon as you educate women and you empower women, the TFR in those countries goes down. This is why we have problems in some of those Middle Eastern countries with those fringe groups that don't see women as being important and they don't want them educated, and so they attack uh, female schools and things like that. The infant mortality rate also has a big uh, role in fertility rates. If you have a high infant mortality rate, then you're going to have more children to replace those that possibly die. In the United States, we still have a fairly high infant mortality rate, even though we are a fairly developed country. And this is mostly due to a lack of health care for impoverished people but also drug addiction among pregnant women, um, and also uh, a high level of teen pregnancy. Uh, even though our teen pregnancy rate is going down, it's still one of the highest in all the developing countries. The average marriage age has gone up as well. Uh, women are no longer getting married very early, therefore their childbearing years are getting uh, a lot smaller of a range. And so women aren't having as many babies because their average marriage age is going up. As I mentioned before, uh, availability of pensions and the, the cost of raising children come hand in hand. So if uh, you don't have any retirement, uh, you don't have any savings or a pension to fall back on, then maybe you're not going to have uh, another child because you know you're not going to be able to support them through college. Um, also in the United States, we have legal abortion. And so uh, that has slowed uh, fertility rates for those women who choose not to have uh, a child. And then religious beliefs also play a huge part in this. A lot of religious 
uh, sex don't believe in abortion or they don't believe in any kind of family planning and so that can drastically change the fertility rate or influence the fertility rate uh, specifically in countries uh, like uh, India and China and things like that that don't really believe in uh, uh, birth control or they, they have traditions and cultural norms that, that preclude that. So let's look at death rates. There are a lot of things that affect death rates too. And one of the things that's interesting about death rates is that because death rates have drastically dropped, this is the reason why population has really increased. It's not because we've had a lot more babies, it's because we've had a lot less people dying. So why are these death rates going down? Well, the biggest thing is higher living standards, better sanitation, cleaner water, cleaner drinking water, uh, higher nutrition, uh, better health care. These are all things that help uh, people live longer. Immigration also plays a huge factor, especially here in the United States. Remember, we are the melting pot. Okay? And that means that people from all over the world want to come and live here because of our government, because of the opportunities that our country provides for them. Um, the U.S. has been basically a magnet for immigration. And since 1820, the most ad we have admitted more immigrants than any other country, all the other countries combined, really. Um, immigrants account for 40% of our population growth, and uh, so that's a huge increase in our population from coming from outer, uh, other countries. Um, and the problem with this is our infrastructure is not prepared for this influx of people. So our health care systems are in, in place, our social security systems are in place, our uh, medical systems are in place, and, and so it, it creates a huge strain on uh, the governments in those areas where we have high levels of immigration. And uh, just recently, the state of Arizona has threatened to sue the United States to kind of close the border a little bit better against Mexico. That way, the state of Arizona doesn't have to pay for all these social programs that these immigrants need when they come to the United States. One of the good things about immigrants, however, is that they do take some of those menial jobs that Americans just don't want to take anymore. Um, many people who grow up in America, they don't want to go out and work in a field anymore. They don't want to work in a clothing shop and get paid less than minimum wage. They don't want to go and clean bathrooms. And so uh, a lot of these immigrants come in and they take these jobs. And these jobs are necessary. One of the ways you can see how a population is going to change in the future is by looking at its age structure. Basically, the age structure is a diagram that shows how the population is, the proportion of population in what reproductive stage they're in. So we have three reproductive periods. So we have a pre-reproductive period, we have a reproductive period, and a post-reproductive period. By looking at the age of each of these groups, you can show how a population is growing or maybe shrinking. So we have some age structure diagrams down here. Down here we have a classic pyramid age structure diagram here that shows that this population is expanding rapidly. We have a large number of pre-reproductive and every five years these groups move up. So after 15 years, this group down here is gonna be here. So and all those people are gonna have babies. So it's gonna get wider and wider as time goes on. So this is a very rapid growing population here. We get into a more steep pyramid and it shows slower population growth, but it still shows population growth. And so uh, the United States is in this, this category here. We are still showing slow growth, but it's not as rapid as this. We want a staple population. You need more of a very steep-sided, uh, almost missile-shaped type of age structure diagram here. Uh, Japan is a very good example of a uh, country that has a, uh, a stable population growth right now. And then you get into declining. When you get an inverted pyramid here, you start seeing a population that is actually decreasing. And so you get more old people than you do young people. And Germany is a good example of this. Also, China is starting to move into this, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Even though it says China over here, China is probably going to move into this eventually. But you can see that most of these countries here are developing countries. We get to developed countries more over in this area. Now, how do we slow population growth? Basically, in order to slow population growth, one thing has to happen. Birth rates have to decrease. You can't stop population growth unless the birth rates decrease. 
Typically, birth rates only decrease in developed countries. So if we want to try and stop population growth or slow population, population growth worldwide, then we have to start getting those developing countries into developed status. And uh, that is very difficult. Now, one way you can look at this is through what we call the demographic transition model. And this is actually a theory that was proposed by some English demographers. It basically said that um, as a society goes through industrialization, their population changes based on the change in their death rate and their birth rate. So if we look over here, it's divided up into four stages. We have the pre-industrial, we have the transitional, we have the industrial, and we have the post-industrial. And then down here we show birth rates and death rates, and then we have the actual population growth here. So in the pre-industrial stage, and this is back to hunter-gatherer society, or in the beginning of the United States here, we have very high birth rates and death rates. This means that there's probably not very good medical care, there's probably a lot of agriculture going on, we need lots of children to run the fields and so forth, um, but a lot of people die as well, and so your population stays very low. As you move into the transitional stage, then our death rates start to decline. We get more technology, better medicine, better uh, drinking water quality. And so our death rates decline, but our birth rates are still relatively high here. And because of that, then our population starts to spike up. As we get into the last part of the transitional stage, finally our birth rates start to fall. And it's not until we get into the industrial stage where birth rates almost start to meet death rates here but our population is still slowly growing. We've got past the rapid growth, but we're still slowly growing here. This is where the United States really is right now. We get into post-industrial, and you would kind of think the United States is post-industrial, but our population is still over here. Then the population evens out, and then even death rates uh, stay about the same, and birth rates will fall even lower than death rates, and then our population starts to actually fall here and decline, and that's the post-industrial stage. So the theory was that all societies would go through this as they went through industrialization. So the idea would be to try and get those developing countries to get through industrialization. The trouble is a lot of societies get stuck in this stage because they can't get some of this uh, food production and health and uh, that kind of thing. And then you have other kinds of economic and political things that happen that keep them in that stage. So how do we slow birth rates? One of the major ways to do it and the way we did it here in the United States is family planning. Um, however, religious beliefs still prevent a lot of this from uh, happening, but birth control, uh, uh, spacing of um, births, you can do timing, but uh, basically any way you can do family planning. 58% of married women in developed countries practice family planning. And that compares to 51% in developing countries. So the developing countries are still a little bit behind. And that's mostly because of poverty and also cultural beliefs. Um, basically, uh, a lot of people think that family planning should be extended to teenagers and unwed w women. There are different cultures out there that don't want teenagers to know about family planning or condoms or birth control. And they are afraid that if they do promote these things, then... Uh, that promotes. Now another good way is to empower women. When you empower women then they take responsibility for their bodies, they take responsibility for their actions, they become better educated, uh, they have fewer children. The problem is is that there are a lot of women out there not getting education. I specifically mentioned the Middle East. Middle East uh, countries, some of them have a huge problem with women becoming educated. Uh, they don't, they believe it's against their uh, religious beliefs uh, and they actually have killed women because they're trying to get educated. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's a huge problem uh, trying to get women educated in some of these developing countries. Let's look at two case studies. The first one is India. India, back in the uh, 1950s, uh, started a family planning initiative. And in fact, they were the first country to ever start a family planning initiative and knew that their population was growing too fast. They knew they weren't gonna have the food to feed all those people or the resources to take care of all those people. And so they started a countrywide family planning initiative. They did succeed, sort of, because their average birth rate went from 5.3 to 3.3%, but 3.3% is still very high. And so uh, the problem was is that 
their plan uh, suffered because of poverty and uh, cultural norms. Once again, in this case, males are much more uh, sought after in the family than females, and so people would keep on having babies until they had a male. And government didn't do a very good job of putting this out there. And uh, so, unfortunately, India is still a fairly rapidly growing country, and it's the second most populous country in the world. And uh, so India tried, um, they had some success, but they, they basically it's been uh, almost a, a failure. The other case study we want to look at is China. Now China, back in the 1960s, went to what we call the one-child policy. And remember, China is a uh, communist country, so this was basically an edict passed down to their, their population. And basically it said that uh, that you would be given property and you'd be given uh, money and so forth if you uh, agreed to having only one child in your family. And so the, the problem was is that once again in China, culturally, it's more advantageous to have a male in the family because that male then passes on the culture of the family. Whereas a female, uh, when she got married, she takes on the culture of her husband. And so it's more advantageous for them to have males. And the problem was is that this was invasive. It was highly restrictive to the people of China because they were kind of forced to do this because it's a communist country, obviously. Um, and the problem was we had some illegal abortions happening. We had uh, news stories of uh, mothers killing their uh, infant daughters. Uh, we had a lot of baby girls being put up for adoption and things like that. Um, the, the good thing about this was that their population definitely decreased, or, or their, their, their TFR definitely decreased. Went from 5.7 to 1.6 uh, really quickly. And uh, so uh, that was a good thing for China is that they actually reduced their TFR, but they did it in a way that probably wouldn't work in a lot of countries. There is a problem though, however, with China, and I mentioned this earlier, is that they're starting to get into a possible negative growth area. So if we look at China's population back in 2010 and we look at their age structure diagram down here, we see their biggest population is in this area here. They're just starting to get out of their childbearing years and they're having fewer and fewer children. And so we have a limited amount of pre-reproductive uh, people down here. And as they get older and they move into this, then they're probably gonna have fewer children as well. And so that presents a problem for China. Uh, and so uh, China's population is actually getting older and when a population in a country gets older then we have problems with technology, they lose brain power. Um, also it creates huge health issues for them because the majority of their, pro their population is elderly and needs health care. And so China is still dealing with their population problem but now their, pop their problem has switched to an elderly problem rather than an overpopulation problem. Uh, but uh, that's something that we'll have to see how they work on that in the future. I hope you learned something about how populations change, and uh, this was helpful for you.